how many business owners truly serve their customers. Mm. And if you can, I, I believe if you can do that, and I'm in the yeah. process of doing this right now with this new venture, the money will come. Yeah. Right? You're creating something of value, you're solving problems, the money will come. Rave Ready is a beast, and I got to chat with him live here in Los Angeles. Rava is an entrepreneur, creative, and founder. More than that, he is a kind-hearted and intentional person. Rava is currently working on Ver Services. Prior to Ver Services, he led Voyage, an e-commerce enablement company, from a distressed asset to 10x growth and a $68 million valuation as CEO. That's wild. Before that, he co-founded a fintech venture, Aparisa Pay, which he exited in 2021. I could go on and on about Rava's knowledge and skills, but you're going to have to hear it for yourself. It's that good. Riddle of the week. What do you call a line of men waiting to get haircuts? Stay tuned to the end of the episode to find out. That was the intro. Now here is the episode. Rava, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here, Nick. Glad to have you on. I'm going to start with this, uh, the deepest cut that I could find. Love it. We're going to we're going to kick it right off. The year after you graduated from the Wharton School with a degree in economics, finance, and healthcare management and policy, Doctor Guru N. Reddy, who I am assuming you have a relation to, perhaps your father, perhaps founded Continental Hospital in. 2013. It's uh, India's first lead qualified super speciality hospital. Now it has 800 beds and more than 50 specialties. And in your first year, you drove in over a million dollars in revenue. And I want to know, was this all planned going into college to have you deep dive into the, the hospital? Or was it like, hey, I need you, son, get in here. Is all any of that true? <laughs> I was supposed to be a doctor, uh, like a lot of my fellow Indians. Uh -huh. I was good at school. My dad was a physician who came to the US from India to make a living, mm -hmm. did quite well for himself. At the last minute out of high school, I decide I'm going to go to Wharton and not the seven year med school program Ooh. that I applied to without telling my dad. Yeah. Keep in mind, I had a pretty deep seated fear and uh, this common kind of relationship with our Indian fathers about following in their footsteps. At that time, I, I think the, the intuition, which has certainly been true over the past 12 years in the workforce, was that if I go into business and management and technology, I can create uh, leverage, I can create impact at scale yeah. versus a doctor, which certainly admirable and respectful uh, can help one patient at a time. Mm -hmm. So that was the intuition for me going to school. And this working at the hospital. So I spent a year at McKinsey right after college. Yeah. Then I went to the hospital. That was kind of my foray into believing that applying this business impact side to a hospital, a yeah. kind of happy medium between being a doctor and yeah. other business was the right route for me. So he always likes to say he never pressured me to come. Yeah. I felt, I would say, <laughs> inspired to help the family with the brief experience I got uh, already in the professional world. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the story of yeah. those two years. Yeah. Inspired, I like that word. So you must have had a little bit of the entrepreneurship bug or business bug in the back of your mind. From the people that I've met that have gone into entrepreneurship, it seems like from an early age, there is like a little bit of an itch. So that itch was there around that time, you'd say? My first business growing up was the classic, I'm sure this was a lot of first businesses for folks in my generation too, was burning CDs. Oh, I don't know nice. if you're familiar with that, <laughs> yeah. but burning, printing a label, <laughs> yeah. charging 20 bucks, uh -huh. downloading the music illegally, shouldn't say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was the Lime first wire. business. <laughs> made some money, made, made a little money, but definitely had, I think, the desire to help people. That has really driven me throughout, I would say, the different ventures in my career. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say I'm a pure kind of entrepreneurial hustler. There's, mm. there's some people who are so amazing that just like flipping something and making money that way, yeah, right? So yeah. I don't know if that best describes me, but I think really being able to create an elegant solution to a problem by doing so helping people is what yeah. has inspired me over the years. That's interesting you say that because there is a lot of, there's a lot of hustle mindset out there, but you've also don't have crazy accomplishments under your belt in the entrepreneurship field and realm. So I don't know if you're being humble or if that's the truth. <laughs> I guess I just, you know, I, I, maybe they're impressive. I, I feel like I have so much work to do and yeah. it's just, you know, it's big goals ahead and yeah. that's what drives me every day. Yeah. We'll get to the future stuff. I got some more past stuff for okay. you. You launched a health tech thing, which I feel like is in relation to the hospital. So I'm going to, I'm going to jump. I'm going to skip a little bit. Okay. You launched a consumer social app that found its way 
to number 158 on the Apple Store. And the question I have from that, well, one, obviously, what what is that app? And then yeah. two, everything I know about consumer apps is they have the cold start problem. Like, you know, they need enough people um, to be valuable, uh, like users, but how do you even get them going? So give me the lowdown, Ray. Oh give my me gosh. the lowdown. What a, what a crazy time. And <laughs> that really proves that you have to be a bit delusional to mm. start products sometimes when yeah. you have these big visions. I would say in general, I'm a big idealist. I've learned a lot about business, um, consumer versus B2B SaaS. There's a whole trope in startup land about you start out a consumer social founder and then you turn to b2b SaaS right away mm. oh, it's really? much more approachable mm. there's an established market that kind of thing uh consumer social is very difficult um everything's hard right but there's almost naivety that led uh led me to uh build this application uh this app Lo- have love music you can see in the apartment there's yeah. music all around so I had inspiration to try to bring these two things together, music and business. And so we felt we built a social listening app. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's actually a competitor now that exists and has done well since our time there. We shut down or I would say pivoted into something else. Nice. Good work. Good Uh, work. Pivoted into B2B. (laughs) We worked with some labels on some services stuff. Really cool. But uh, Station Head is kind of the leader in the market now. But bringing Mm -hmm. people together to listen through music. Yeah. So thinking about listening, uh, listening events. Um live album drops listening mm. together. Yeah. That was kind of the premise. Clubhouse is probably a good analog to that too. Okay. So we actually worked on some podcast stuff and drew in listeners. Nice. The minimal success we did have where we got ranked on the app store, the cold start problem, building the supply side. So we were able to engage some influencers. Um, we actually worked with a label at the time, LA Reads label, Hitco, and worked oh, nice. with a few of their artists to drop their albums live and attract audiences. So That's we actually cool. made money. Yeah, That wow. was like one of the first dollars That's, generated yeah. through the App Store. It was <laughs> pretty great. cool. We got ranked. Um, but what a wild time. Just, yeah, it's, it's tough. It's tough, though. It seems tough. What do you th- Was it early on and where apps were kind of the craze at that point? Like, what era we, like... It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't super, super early. Maybe 2018, 2017, oh, that's, 2018. That's, yeah. that's Fairly recent. Yeah, fairly recent. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah it was six years ago, right? You're yeah. still boys with L.A. Reid or what? No, I did not be L.A. Reid. It's someone on his team. But gotcha. we got to do some, uh, afterwards, we pivoted to the services business and we did some cool marketing products with Interscope artists, uh, Black Bear. Remember? Oh, Hot, yeah. Hot Girl, Bummer, that song? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was like, I got we helped, on my Spotify. I got awesome. it. Awesome. We helped promote it on Twitter. It got to like trending and number one. So that was pretty cool. Did you have aspirations of, did you have your own music on there? That's a good question. Um, I did not. I would say that I've spent a lot of the past year getting back into music mm. um and playing it for fun and for i would say spiritual yeah. nourishment if you yeah. will i got a friend that he works at one of the larger music places mm. but he came from you know doing his own music stuff and i th- i think what i've seen this is just third party is he uh he's lost that bit of like connection to the music because now he was he's in the business portion of it is that what it feels like i think that totally Ha- describes, I would say, my relationship with it, having worked a little bit with the industry, mm-hmm. is realizing that you search for ways to combine your passions. Obviously, the, yeah. the ideal is that you love what you do every day. Yeah. What I've found is that maybe by not pursuing music on a professional basis, whether in the business side or creative side full time, I'm able to preserve the more natural relationship to the creation mm-hmm. of it. So I, there's no expectation on monetizing it, for example. Yeah. Um, just just playing it and enjoying it in the moment. Yeah. There's a lot of pressure in general for creative folks like that. I feel like now, maybe because it's so available or maybe because we see it so often, it's like, if you're not making money doing this thing that you like, why are you even doing it? Which it seems backwards because then I almost feel like it doesn't let you explore to those extreme places or experimental places, which is where really good things come from. Because like, I'm gonna stay safe. I'm gonna stay where I think maybe more people might like this. Yeah, I totally agree. I think the pressure to commercialize, especially in this country is, uh, can be tough on artistry. And I mean, you produce uh, one of these podcasts, The Daily yeah. Vedantic with James. And one of the core principles is to do it from internal motivation and not mm. let external sources kind of influence the way you go about your duty. And I think Rick Rubin says this very clearly, who's obviously a very popular individual. Um, being authentic to yourself is the key. Mm. And so I totally buy into that and try to practice that every day, even in entrepreneurship, yeah. honestly. When I'm listening to The Daily V while I'm producing it, James says this pretty frequently, work without attachment is worship. How do we unpack that? Because I feel like that's what it is. But sometimes is it attachment to outcome? Is yeah. it how? That's what it is. So essentially what you're talking about, internal motivation. It's almost impossible 
but it's possible. Okay. Where, I mean, I don't, I'm not a master yet by any means. Yeah. I do feel like when I find these pockets of like detached workflow mm -hmm. where I'm just in the zone, very connected to the higher purpose, mm -hmm. for example, serving early stage founders working on something new right now, when I'm really motivated by the desire to help them versus, oh, mm. am I gonna make enough money for X, Y, and Z in my life? Yeah. That's when like magic happens. Yeah, I'm gonna sit on that and have it come back later in the conversation, likely. I wanna spend some time with uh, Apriza, Apriza Pay? Apriza, yes. Apriza. Yes. Yes. I should have, I should have did the Marion Webster <laughs> audio thing before this. Um, you were a co-founder. Mm -hmm. So what did that look like? And I want to know, like, how early in the process did you come aboard that founding team from the beginning, jump in later? Yeah. How did it work? At the idea stage, in Whoa. full disclosure, I was the young founder with limited experience. And this was an experience management team. So I was oh, the young guy awesome. just proving myself and running around to do everything I could to add value. Yeah. But I'm a hard worker. And uh, the thing <laughs> I really owned was the finance and accounting of the company. So it was a financial technology company, helped drive cross-border remittances from US to Mexico. So mm -hmm. we were the compliance layer, a B2B SaaS, we talked we about go. earlier, yeah. B2B software, built all the kind of accounting and uh, financial uh, transaction layers, compliance, all that um, from the ground up. By the time I left, uh, went part-time, we were doing maybe $250 million in cross-border remittances. That's so what I got. Quite, quite at scale. How does that even, how do you even build a workflow to manage all of that's that's those are fat stacks yeah you gotta be organized and this is something <laughs> yeah. um on the, on the new venture I'm, I'm i'm working on with other founders even if you're managing five million dollars let's say in cash in cash out a year it's really important to be organized that yeah. money if you find leakage if you're paying vendors that you don't need to all this stuff it yeah. adds up and really Fast. being on top of your money is really important yeah here's what i got for you too in this lane you had a company majority exit this was your first exit, I take it, yes. at the time? Yes. What was the process of the exit like? And I almost think this is what this is what entrepreneurs talk about a lot. They talk about the exit. They, they glorify it in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. But nobody ever talks about what happens after, like how you live your life after. Yeah. So give me the, well, maybe start with the exit process and how yeah. that was. And especially if, you're, if you were the young founder with running around making value happen. Yeah. Like, did it feel a little bit surreal at the same time too? I will say, so to answer a few of those uh, nights there, I was not expecting we were going to exit at that time. And it was a tranched exit. So the initial exit was, I would say, modest, more yeah. modest than we were underwriting before. And then the second exit, this was to a strategic bank, which is a very interesting insight that I do have something to say about. Okay. But <laughs> the second layer of the exit was much higher than I was expecting. Huh. So it's almost kind of unexpected. Yeah. And that's one thing I've learned about entrepreneurship. You think you know what's going to happen. Sometimes like the exact opposite happens, yeah. right? Yeah. I thought we were going to exit for hire at the beginning and then, you know, that was going to be it. But it was this tranche exit that offered us, the founders, a lot more. Ultimately, I would say that because we built the company in a way that was very strategic. So given the management team had relationships with kind of the big players in the industry, um, we took an investment from a strategic player. So we were almost building with, and this is something that I'm, is almost anti-Silicon Valley in a way, we were almost building with some downside protection mm. where we knew that there was a possibility the strategic may offer to buy us. I and that's yeah. what happened. Oh, nice. And so I think this idea of taking strategic capital yeah. is a very compelling and interesting thing that founders should explore, especially as all this stuff in venture is changing right before our eyes. Mm -hmm. um, and that really benefited us. Hey, Nick here. If you are enjoying the podcast, please give this a review on the podcast platform you're listening to. If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and give us a like. Give us a subscribe. This season, I'm aiming to be extra intentional about serving you all. So head to the show notes for freebies on how to live a more fulfilling life and level up your business. All right, back to the episode. So I'm starting something right now as well. And I feel very, I, when I read that, I feel, I resonate with the fact of like being someone that has more people with, they have much more experience than I do. I'm, I'm, there's two other or three other co-founders on this team. And what we just did, and we talk about this every time we meet, is like we have a 1% chance of success mm. at any of this happening. But if we can get, like you're saying, almost like your first, or at least for us, it would be our first customer that can we could offer equity in addition to like providing the service. That seems mm -hmm. like the chance of being acquired 
skyrockets because you have a foot in the door and they're already using your stuff. That's kind of what it sounds like this was. I will say nothing's guaranteed. And with right. everything that has upside, there's downside too. So yeah. I will say during that whole journey, even though it turned out to be a positive end result in yeah. a sense, there were times where we were being strong armed oh, because they were yeah. a partner who oh. kind of owned, they kind of <laughs> yeah. owned us. We had other sources of revenue, but they were by far the majority oh. supplier. That's why they controlled the valuation on the first kind of tranche of the exit. But mm. on the second one, they knew they had to buy out all the minority investors. Yeah. And so they had to offer a premium because it was kind of like, you don't have to take this, but we right. really want it. So we're right. going to offer something you can't say no to. But yeah, those dynamics are what are tricky. But look, nothing's perfect. If you get a customer, that's the beauty of, I'm not sure. I mean, a lot to hear about the business you're building. Yeah. Depending on the dynamics of the industry, if you get a big enterprise customer, let's say, and you're building for them, it's always a bit tricky because... They do have power in a sense, negotiating yeah. power, but they also are providing a roadmap onto what they want, which yeah. is the upside in the whole thing. The strong arm thing really stands out to me that I think the power dynamics every time there is a deal is fascinating to me because the deal always has to make sense for everybody. Mm -hmm. From what I've seen, and you can tell me if this is true too, it really seems like there's price and terms. Mm -hmm. Those are the only two things that really people care about is like, you're either going to get your price on my terms or I'm going to get your price my terms i think that's the right flip i think that's roughly right i yeah. think everything in business is incentive alignment so mm. depending on what they want it for ideally it's what you want it for too where incentives are aligned but sometimes they may have a different reason for buying i was just reading an article in the journal about earnouts are becoming a lot more popular in private equity deals mm. about a third of deals have earnouts the management team has to perform after they exit when they stay on and yeah to to de-risk it for the buyer Makes i think sense, that's roughly right, right. and yeah. i think they always say right a negotiation successful one is one where uh, both parties feel don't win bit. right yeah. feel a little bit that, like they lost and i yeah. think that's true yeah okay let's talk about the exit the exit's made and now I'm assuming you wiped your hands clean, like you're you're done. You didn't have to stay on. So for context, when the company exited, I was advising the company, so I wasn't working there full time, which oh, is man. different yeah. from most exits you hear, right? Where the founders are working and then they yeah. have the exit and then they pop the champagne and they don't work for a while. Yeah, yeah, so that's different. what I was thinking. <laughs> but I, what I will say is, I was um, during that time, I was uh, leading uh, another startup um, as a CEO, and I will say when the exit happened my capital situation changed, liquidity. Mm -hmm. And what it did is it inevitably changed the way I looked at the risk of the startup I was running. Because mm. now when you have some cash and liquidity, I'm gonna go for the next kind of step and yeah. think about taking yeah. a bigger risk. Yeah. Of course, you always wanna do right by, by shareholders and never um, let your personal situation influence the right action for the company. But I think it was a positive and I can see higher potential in this company to deliver higher returns to these shareholders. and. I mean, like anything, that's it's our pers our situations and how we think about risk and reward. Yeah, um, was was changed for sure. Do you have a high risk tolerance? I think I do. <laughs> relative to, uh, in some ways, I do. In some ways, I'm I'm pretty conservative actually. Yeah. Uh, for example, invest my money, but I'm definitely an idealist. Is what I've learned about myself mm -hmm. <laughs> over these thirty four years. So you had this other company, and this is Voyage. Mm -hmm. This is CEO. I also want to talk to you about this too, because going from co founder to in, in like the finance accounting, building mm -hmm. those workflows to the CEO, I'm learning this right now. So mm -hmm. this is like also really me trying to learn from your experience. Yeah. Um, it's different. Like CEO, it feels like, maybe this is just my idea of it. It's like, not only do you have to cast this vision, but you have to lead and inspire and make people believe in the vision too, to have them ultimately do great work to build this vision. And then it's like this, this cyclical thing. How did you feel moving into the CEO role after having done something like that? I imagine you have the experience now, so maybe more, more confidence as well. Definitely more confidence now. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit of a curse of knowledge thing where it's almost hard to be, to exactly remember how it felt like when mm. I was early on in those days. But I will say, even with the, the co-founding of Apriza, with all due respect to all co-founders of any types, the CEO role is like another level of just responsibility of course you know worked very hard and and had the founder spirit mentality at, uh, at apriza um, and even technically not being a founder at voyage as a ceo i felt it completely transformed my ability to see what we we're capable of and push ourselves mm -hmm. to like you said balance speaking of the vision hiring people raising capital and making sure your operations are running day to day and growing the company yeah. there's so many moving parts there is definitely a more effective way to do it than not. And what I learned during those three and a half years is less is more. 
really pick your top two or three priorities for mm-hmm. a week. Your mental and spiritual health is so important. Mm. So I say this to founders all the time. The yeah. daily Vedantic, Vedanta yeah. is ironically probably the most pragmatic thing you can study to be a better yeah. founder. Yeah. It doesn't seem like that. It seems like you should be reading more business books or studying right. math. I promise you, mental health, spiritual health is so key during this journey as a CEO. Interesting. I can think of some benefits of avoiding burnout, mm-hmm. clarity of mind, feeling better so you don't snap at people likely or, or treat them in wrong ways. Cause I feel like that also has a bit of a connotation when people say CEO, like yeah. you gotta be, you gotta lay down the law kind of thing. Are those the benefits you see from the practical sense of taking care of those things? Those are exactly the practical benefits. And that comes from a deeper sense of being in tune with your true nature, being internally at peace. This was a year and a half ago. I was working as a CEO and I was, you see me now, but I was 25 pounds heavier. I was like drinking on the weekends. Oh no. Um, I was staying up till 2 a.m., all this stuff. Like, and I thought I was working harder and I was doing what I needed to do, that it was just so such a hard job that this is what life looks like as a startup CEO. But now I can look back on that. And while some of that may have been true given the circumstances, um, even beyond my control, majority of it was an internal world I created Mm. from what I thought it should Mm. be projected. So that's why Vedanta and just whatever, whatever your religion or philosophy is, but having this deeper kind of sense of self and something higher, I think is so valuable. What changed? There's got to be a moment or like something happened where you're like, this is unsustainable. Yeah, I mean, without going too into the details, so I was not the founder of the company. I left the company in December of last year, and I basically took the whole year off to reflect Dang. on what I wanted life to look like. My whole life, I mean, I talk about Vedanta. I was literally an atheist when I was a kid at some for, mo- for a lot of my childhood. Yeah. So I never would have thought I would be speaking this way about yeah. the higher and spirituality. But there was a temptation after leaving to go into the next thing, become um, the CEO again of another startup later yeah. stage or um, go, you know, get a, get a job at one of our potential acquirers or something like that. But I really resisted that temptation to be on the go, 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 you know, success is everything. Yeah. I come from a general culture where we're pretty, um, I love my heritage. And I mean, it's literally the author of Vedanta, so I can't yeah. speak bad about that. Um, but I think um, with a lot of communities over time become can tend to be status and label oriented. And so there's a temptation to get that higher title, right? Or go to the uh, Ivy League school to make mm. you feel secure. But that's not, I, I no longer believe that's what life's about. And it's really about being your true self and what lights you up. Mm. I feel like I need to be snapping some <laughs> at the poetry thing. But that's it's very, I mean, it's all it rings all too true. I can think of myself and a handful of people in my circle that are all pursuing similar things and running into those exact same. It's mm-hmm. it's like these problems aren't new and the solutions aren't new either. It's just implementing them like we know we should or yeah. finding that. I don't want to use the word balance, but maybe boundaries is a better you know word. So instead of cutting it off at 2 a.m., maybe delegate the last four hours of your day. So I think that's right. <laughs> and, you know, change is very possible. I'm I'm someone who believes that we can change so much as long as it's aligned with our true nature, that mm-hmm. is our potential, but it's one of the hardest things to do, right? Creating new habits, implementing that change because you're going to regress and not get discouraged that it's so difficult. That's why I told myself I'm not going to work for up to a year, yeah. like not even kind of think about yeah. um, capital. And, you know, I am, I was lucky enough to have some capital to be able to be focused that yeah. way. Um, but it was also risky because I'm, I'm consuming my savings to do yeah. this. And I just thought this is the reset I need that I've never done. And I'm so glad I kind of committed to it. What'd you find out about yourself? I found out that I had been very externally driven in the sense of maybe on one hand, feeling like I need to be the CEO to feel like I was living up to parental expectations Mm. or feel like I was successful, but that wasn't truly who I am. Mm. I'm actually, as I said, an idealist and kind of a rebel. I always have been. That's why yeah. I didn't go to med there school as an Indian kid, yeah. right? <laughs> um, so that, that's my true nature. And even during my time at Voyage, I kind of lost sight of playing instruments. Mm. Um, and I used to play the drums a lot. One of the first songs I learned was Toxicity on the Drums. Oh, I don't nice. know if you know that song. Toxicity yeah. of my sister. Exactly. <laughs> I sat down for 12 hours to learn that. That's how into it, like yeah. drums I was. And so just getting back in tune with this kind of creative side was something I was like, I'm never going to let that go again in my life. I need to create a life that allows me to be connected to this and be able to help people in a genuine way. Not saying making money is bad by any means. That's how capitalism works. But being in tune with those higher ideals was really important. Yeah. This um, 
the conversation of being money driven comes up a lot for entrepreneurs and the folks that I gravitate to, it seems like it's impact driven and money is just a result of driving that impact. And I think that's much more, I don't want to use the word admirable, but the right, that is the right way to do it. You should be thinking of others first. And if the money comes along, I think that is almost like a, a reassurance to that you're serving people. I think that's exactly right. And again, it can be hard to practice when you, for example, have bills to pay pay. or you expire to this lifestyle, right? Truly surrendering where it's about the customer, you know, truly serving your customers. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, yoga for your intellect, it's a podcast and Joseph says this, how many business owners truly serve their customers? Mm. And if you can, I I believe if you can do that, and I'm in the process of doing this right now with this new venture, the money will come. Yeah. Right? You're creating something of value. You're solving problems. The money will come. Yeah, which makes sense. Something else that you did as a CEO is you raised a good a good chunk through angel and institutional capital, increasing the share price a f- f- couple dollars. Do you have a fundraising strategy? Did you then? How did it work out? Did you have a good network you were pulling from? Do you know? What's the move? I learned a lot about fundraising. Probably spoke to at least 50, if not 100 investors Ooh. in that time. I actually pitching? talking pitch decks, pitch, pitching, Whew. yeah, conversations. Whew. I would say that one thing that comes to mind is I was watching this on TV the other day, just to give a sense for folks who haven't fundraised yet, or maybe they have and are looking to raise millions of dollars or however much. And by the way, I'm by no means the best fundraiser. James is someone who's an amazing fundraiser. I've definitely gotten a lot better. Yeah. Um, but there's some people who've raised hundreds of millions of dollars. So we're talking eight million dollars yeah. for context. Yeah. Uh, but I did learn is. Brandon Marshall said this. Do you, do you know the ex uh, wide receiver on the Broncos? Uh-uh. Okay, well, he's an ex a pro football player. He's a he's a pro bowler. Yeah. He literally said this. They were doing a special of him on ESPN. And he said, I played in the NFL. I've gone to the Super Bowl, I think, or he was a pro bowler. A CEO of a startup right now, founder. And he said, I've been raising capital the past two years. It's been harder than anything I've ever done, including paying, playing in the NFL. Oh, my god! For context, right? Oh, my god! And this is someone with a with an audience, <laughs> probably millions <laughs> yeah. of followers, I'm guessing, at least 100,000. Yeah. And that's what he says. And I, not oh. to scare and terminate, but it, the point is that it is truly a process. Yeah. Of course, depending on the scope of it, if you yeah. have family and friends and network, it depends, right? But I don't mean to scare folks off yeah. about this, this who are fundraising, but just the gravity of what you're really asking. Um, you're asking someone for their money and to be a steward over their money for likely a product or a company that is very high risk. Super it's not trivial. Yeah. And I think t- I was partly in that the, the boom times of, um, it was interesting because uh, when I became the CEO, we were kind of at the tail end of the boom times of startup fundraising where money was almost flowing freely. Mm-hmm. Then it, it immediately switched to very hard. Yeah. So it was interesting how fundraising changed. But having a process and being formal and strategic about it is really important. I'm happy to go into more tactical tips, but that's what I would say is just taking it seriously and being yeah. very intentional about doing it and why is very important. Well, I got to know your process now. I have to just give me just give me a little taste. Give me a little taste of the process. There's no shortcuts, but one of the kind of high level and generalist things I'll say, which may be cliche, but is truly being true to yourself, not trying to be anyone else. Mm. You have to know your strengths as a storyteller but you gotta be a storyteller. You gotta know your numbers, you gotta know your customer, but if you're not telling a narrative about why this is inevitable in terms of success, yeah. of course there's risk in it, everyone understands that, but why this is inevitable in terms of your success, the problem you're working on, why you as the leader of the company are qualified to take this along with the team you're building, mm-hmm. you, you really need to focus on those high level things. Yeah, that's really good. Today I was, this is like almost two, two in line. I was looking at old pitch decks of like Dropbox and mm. Tinder and Uber cab before it was Uber and their pitch decks do exactly that. And I think the critical piece, um, I was doing it to reflect on what I'm, <laughs> what I'm missing from my stuff. We're not raising money, but I do think at any point in time, pitch decks always a good idea. I agree. The story, I actually I feel like I undervalued how important the story is. And it's almost like everything that we consume has a story. So why wouldn't it also be a part of when you're building a business as well? When you're raising money, you're effectively pulling ahead success in a way. Mm -hmm. You don't have to raise money. Maybe your business is capital intensive, but you're basically saying, if I have your money, I can go even faster. Mm. So how can you not tell a story about what that looks like? Yeah. That's a way to think about it. Yeah. When do you think companies should self-fund versus raise capital? 
So I think that this is a very popular debate and yeah. in, in the entrepreneurial community. Um, I think there's passion, passionate folks on either side yeah. that say either is bad or good. Yeah. I think there's a tends to be, can be egoism on both sides as yeah. well. That I never raised a dollar. And yeah. It's, I don't think that's the right way to approach it. I think it very much depends on the business you're building. Mm -hmm. If you're building something that is going to, or aspires to change an industry like an Uber, mm -hmm. of course you're going to need capital. So you have to fundraise yeah. in a sense yeah. if you have that big of a mission vision. But if you're building a SaaS company, a software company as a service company, you can probably get away with bootstrapping it. And in general, I believe that the longer you can go without having to raise capital, the, the better. It forces discipline mm -hmm. on you. It forces you to really examine the problem you're solving, your solution set, all these little things to hire a bit more conservatively. I can admit during Voyage, one of the things, because we were in that kind of zero interest rate phenomenon, we overhired slightly. We had to let mm. people go. That was very painful mm. um, because we had access to capital. And if I were to do it again, I would have hired a lot more slowly during mm. that time. And so that's the downside of capital. It's You almost have too much that you're looking to spend versus yeah. um, being disciplined about it. That makes sense to me. I'm doing something. I do have a follow-up question on the hiring process. I'm doing something differently, and I'm going to get your take on it. I haven't told anybody, so Raymond, mm. this is this is. Hey, appreciate the yeah, trust. Yeah, we're, we're sharing we're sharing things here. Some like one of the fears that I ran into in terms of like raising money for the thing I'm doing. One, I don't think we need it, but two, it's giving up the control too. Yeah, like bringing people in. I heard some horror stories of like people who raised money ended up having to bring in a board, and then the board kicked them out of their own business. And I'm like, I don't even want to get close to something like that. It's something that I did for this business that I think is a little countercultural is we got four co-founders and. The equity vests based on a percentage per like per month. We have a, an allotted amount of expenses over X amount of time. So over the next eighteen months, as we pay for expenses, mm -hmm. our equity gets vested. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like we're self funding, but also like um, I feel like it has some oomph behind. Like we don't want to spend more money than we need to. Mm -hmm. That's my strategy. What are your thoughts, Reva? Is this is this a weird way to do things? Because I don't. I've I've been trying to see if that's common. I don't. I haven't found anything. One thing, I think I've learned. I think hopefully there's still a lot of life to go. Yeah. Uh, there's no one right answer, so it mm. really depends on the situation. To answer your first part about boards. I'm really trying to channel inner spirituality and Vedanta here and be <laughs> calm because <laughs> I've very much seen this before. And you hear stories where people get very clearly you hit oh. a nerve and they, they yeah. go off on a thing. Yeah. So I'm not going to do that. But what I will say is, yes, it's very true. I mean, that even happened to Uber, right? Yeah. And using the Uber example, it happens eventually. Granted, that was a massive public company when that happened, I believe, or maybe they were private, but it was a massive company at that point. That happens. I mean, I've talked to oh. other founders who have built multiple unicorn What's the term for that? Multi unicorn, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. more than a billion, yeah, yeah. a few billion. Talked to a founder that's built a nine figure company and they found it. I remember when they were at the idea stage and they grow it and they get kicked out. How do they get kicked out? It, it control, blows my like mind. Said, control because uh. the board believes, they believe, right, that it's better for someone else to run the company. I've yet to see, and granted, I haven't seen everything, but I've yet to see where that happens and there's a successful story afterwards in a meaningful yeah. way. Yeah, because the person that created it has the vision and is so passionate about yeah. it to get it to that point. Or at least at an earlier stage, maybe like right. mature public companies right. that happens, but I've yeah. yet to see that be successful. I think board, there's a lot of ego in the room too. It's, I mean, I've seen some wild stuff, especially with Apriza and Continental, I said on the board of that as well. Mm -hmm. So you see things with, um, I would say, institution, institutional thinking versus individual thinking differs. Mm. But a lot, I mean, we're all human beings, right? Yeah. And when you're talking about a board, egos are involved. And yeah. you're talking to sometimes exited founders or investors only who may have a lot of personal net worth and ego can just be like, I can do it better. Or yeah. this is an opportunity for me to be in the spotlight. All mm. these things happen. And so that's how it happens, unfortunately. And then it just tanks. It's so sad. We yeah. get in our own ways. Yes, that's how right. How do we do this? It's terrible. You acquired a company. You acquired a company with Voyage. Yes. So it's almost like the process in reverse. 
yeah, it was interesting because yeah. we weren't super late stage or yeah. super big. We had raised maybe $7 million at that point. So not not a ton of capital. It's yeah. all relative, right? Yeah. When I say that, that's yeah. so much uh, depending on how, what we're talking. But um, we it was almost more like a merger of sorts, but it was something where we diluted 16%. So we were definitely the acquirer. Mm. But it was a strategic acquisition of a competitor that we knew in the space, kind of indirect competitor. Mm -hmm. And I remember kind of, I was very passionate about it. We actually had an offer to sell the company at that point. And we instead, we did this acquisition. So in terms of betting betting on uh, future growth and that, that's what we decided to do. Um, (laughs) Even though we had an offer at a very, very good time in the economy. And that's where hindsight's 2020, because there's no way we were getting that valuation six Uh, months or six or even 12 months later. Would you have taken Um, the cash? 2020? Well, now I would have taken the cash. <laughs> but who knows, right? Um, yeah. Hindsight's twenty twenty. Um, the company is still running and everything, yeah. um, but it turned out that that acquisition is actually one of the main drivers of growth and value today. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it seems to be Let's that go. was a good acquisition. But it was so interesting because we were this early, like fairly early stage company, and I remember being very passionate. Like we have to do this, or we're going to sell. That's what yeah. I said. Nice. And I yeah. brought this like deck to the board. We had a five person board, yeah. a lot of people on the board for the state of the company yeah. and just pitched them on this. And we were going to get $4 million of cash alongside this company. So it was like a fundraising round kind of yeah. along with assets. And yeah, we, we bought the company, we merged the teams like, and we added revenue to our top line. And I guess to this day, it was a pretty value accretive, as I say, acquisition. Good stuff. I hear people say it's one of the fastest ways to grow is to acquire. Do you think that's, I mean... Do you think it's true? It seems like it worked out well in this scenario. Yeah, I think everything's context um, yeah. dependent. It was definitely a calculated risk, especially because we weren't a super large company. You know, we were figuring out our own stuff at the same time, but mm-hmm. risk reward, right? I true. felt like it was just the right thing to do. I guess mm-hmm. the board agreed yeah. um, to support it. But yeah, I mean, we added top line right away. Nice. And of course, and savvy investors understand that like you're buying revenue to an extent, but our premise was there's synergy between the two products. So yeah. if you really believe in that and you can execute on it, it is a great way to accelerate growth and just momentum. You're also, the other thing about it for us was the team. Mm. The team that was on the company that we were acquiring was really strong, brought in a different skill set, a lot of experience. So they were leveling us up too in that way, which yeah. is a, a, another, you know, I would say top reason why companies acquire other companies is for talent. That makes sense. I, that was one of the things I was thinking about too, is like you have these two separate companies that probably have their own sets of processes and now they're combined and suddenly you have to combine them in some way of workflow and things like that. But I mean, from the appraisa you're organized so did it was that part portion of it smooth and were they so related that it was like okay this town's coming in there's not going to be that much trouble in terms of like catching them up to speed or or even a change of culture too i think because we were almost equal sized assets Uh it was the culture thing is probably the number one thing that may backfire Mm. this is i I don't know for sure because i haven't been in the inside of a massive organization that's acquired another one but i would just extrapolate that that's what happens yeah for us it was interesting because i feel like our culture kind of amalgamated into one that was a better yeah because we brought different perspectives together nice but the biggest learning which i would say is another aspect of why there were there were certainly things that were tough about the role that i was kind of sucking up out of ego that i talked about but there were also things that i really enjoyed and one of the things that i can firmly say that i enjoy about building a company and just creating is the people side mm. not necessarily the day-to-day management of people and that is the big skill set when you're buying mm. a company or just even growing i mean at our peak we were probably 40 maybe 50 folks including folks overseas and that that's not not small mm-hmm. at a certain point to manage right but just the diversity of beliefs, wanting to see people succeed, all of that is just so rewarding that it was just super cool to be able to accelerate that and see these different personalities in the room. On that note, I feel like I have something that's perfect to bring up. Antoine, Mm -hmm. Screve. Yes. I've had the pleasure to report to Rev at Voyage, his ability to set a clear vision that drives KPIs, hire top talent and fundraise, make him ideal for the CEO role. I feel like if that's not being able to connect with people where they like respect and enjoy your vision. That's great. I wanted to bring that up. Hopefully. Yeah. It's one's an awesome guy. I uh, appreciate it. He was an early employee of voyage. We got to work pretty closely together. It always makes me happy if people see or enjoy working with me. It really does. I try not to attach to it too much, the point yeah. of attachment, but it's definitely one of the more rewarding things about the job. 
what would you say your leadership style was in and in line with the context of the culture i this is i feel like i'm just spewing things i've heard but this is still <laughs> pretty much true every time your company doubles in terms of employees like uh-huh. two to four four to eight eight to 16 the culture changes this is what i've heard i mean so especially in this acquisition and also being aware of that and being the ceo and leading this what would you say the precedent of your culture was and then also your leadership style because if connecting with people is at the root of it i yeah. feel like that that changes how you do things yeah i think that's roughly right in terms of the size so it changes fast if you're growing fast i'm glad right? i'm hearing the right things and so every <laughs> every individual you add to the team or that joins the team is going to change the environment change the culture and so that's very very fast adaptation. I would say that because I wasn't the original founder of the company it was interesting because you almost have this founder DNA if you mm. will into a company. And that's something I learned over time as I was the CEO of a very early company which I like to say the CEO of any company under like 20 people isn't really a CEO. Maybe you have that title but to be a CEO you're managing people and you're like a founder in a sense. But I think because there was maybe a diversity in the way the original founder approached the business versus me taking over after um, he stepped down as CEO, there was almost kind of a little bit of a gradual shift to more of my DNA in the company Mm -hmm. when I was running it. Mm -hmm. So that just took time. And then of course, as you you hire folks, it kind of adds onto their personality and how they inject their personality. There was one individual in particular who was actually uh, an exited founder. So similar to how Apriza exited for me, brilliant individual, super people person really cared about his team, which I really appreciated. I, I told him that he was the person who influenced me the most, um, mm. impacted me the most positively in 2022, I believe. Mm. And he was actually the CTO of the company. So experienced wow. guy. And he really taught me and I think brought out this natural tendency for me to, I think I truly cared about our employees, sometimes to a fault mm. where you do kind of have to take care of your personal health first. Right. You want to see your employee get your employees get compensated well, for example, but you gotta do you gotta preserve the company first too, otherwise there's no company to serve. Yeah. So that tension was something I really learned. But I would say I do care about the individual success of our employees. I try to be not micromanaging where it's set goals and then delegate and let yeah. people kind of execute. Yeah, I think I would still I'm still evolving leadership a little bit. Yeah. I find I've been finding that's I shouldn't say difficult to find, but it is it is friction that i'm finding Mm. because that seems like the most in here you go this is in the front this is this is what you need let me compensate you a little more but really i think like people value different things in terms of like i've heard people say time off i've heard people say investment in themselves or being able to invest in them do you have a strategy to get to the root of what gets people to tick because I mean, we're also getting into the idea of like people are intrinsically motivated or they're not. You can yeah. only motivate them so far. So this is all, it's a finicky game, you know? For sure. I'm going to cite Vedanta again Let's before do I it. do that. Let's do it. <laughs> uh, before I do that, one one thing to your previous question about what matters so much is why you're doing what you're doing. Ooh. So did you build this company to make a lot of money? Did mm. you do it out of a deeper purpose, um, an initiative to help X, Y, and Z? And you may be able to hide it but that will genuinely come out in terms of the people you attract. Mm. So if you're all in it for the money, you're going to attract people who are all in it for the money. That said, everyone's different. So even if you are genuinely motivated by some higher purpose, you may have someone who tends to prefer cash a little bit more than equity. That might be for personal reasons too. And that's where flexibility is important and and to be non-judgmental. But ideally, you are seeing that the ideal answer is folks are internally motivated. Of course, compensation matters. But this is what Vedanta says, right? I was just studying a lecture this morning. Intrinsic motivation is multiple times stronger than external incentives. Mm -hmm. External incentives are compensation. Mm -hmm. Of course, you should be paid fairly for your work. Right. But if you can get people to align around a mission, that's where you're going to see the best work. Not to switch gears completely here. All good. But we're moving. We're moving into, um, I want to know, you're on a hiatus right now. Is that correct? So I was last year. I started to build something new. That's a Ver services. Ver yes. services, baby. Yes. Tell me about Ver services. Tell me yes. about this, the bright future ahead. Now we're the getting into future. the juice here. The bright future for anyone. The reason why it's a bright future is because I'm being true to myself. And this is kind of the, I would say, the dream mission for the rest of my life. The way I kind of did the exercise every week last year for 52 weeks, I just wrote down what is my ideal life purpose and what are kind of the highest life ideals I can pursue. Mm-hmm. And this is how I came up with. I would say the 
ambitious mission of Bear Services. We are starting off more tactically, but the ambitious mission was inspired by my time as a CEO at Voyage and other entrepreneurial experiences of as a CEO, as a leader, you have to keep track of so much to keep a company too running much and growing, right? At times. Too much, yeah. exactly. The reality is to really make meaningful progress, however, you should be focused on one, two, maybe three things a week. Mm. The most strategic areas of the business, for example, product and distribution. That's kind of the classic framework in Silicon yeah. Valley. Are you building something that people want? Are you getting it out there where they can buy it? Yeah. And uh, but then you also have to look at your accounting and your finances, and there's HR stuff, and there's lawyers, and there's operations, people. there's people, of yeah. course, right? And so the long-term mission of Air Services is how do we take off that work that needs to get done that can be offloaded from the founders, CEOs, management team so they can focus on their strategic areas and their zone of, zones of genius. Yeah. I think especially with AI now, that's going to be increasingly possible. Yeah. But we want folks to be loving what they're doing because they're in their zone of genius. They are focusing on the most strategic pillars of their business. And the area we're starting off today is the finance and accounting side. Mm. And I would say business and nice. administrative operations side. So I have a finance background. From, a from killer, Morton. a killer finance background too, with a Prisa too, is all of it. Yeah. So I love numbers and music is what I would say. Yeah. <laughs> nice. uh, so numbers have always come uh, naturally to me. And finance really is the kind of blueprint of an organization. You can tell what a company prioritizes, what their, their margin levers are, how they're creating value. And so getting your numbers right is actually incredibly critical. The the pain points I faced during my time at Voyage as a CEO were we had multiple vendors doing our accounting, doing our accounts payable. Um, we, were, we were scaled enough where it didn't make sense for me to do at this point because we had a product that was selling. Mm -hmm. And so what was the ideal system or partner that could take all of this work off our plate where we could have reliable numbers to review every month? We had a budget that we were being held account accountable to yeah. every month, every quarter. Um, and just a great experience, really. Yeah, That's one thing I've learned is even in traditional businesses, sometimes the customer experience sucks. And if so you can just bad. make that better, yeah, like that's the business I'm building, yeah. what I was lacking during my yeah. time there. And so we're a one-stop solution for those services. And we want founders and CEOs to rely on our numbers. Also be a strategic partner where we can discuss key financial decisions. If you're deciding to spend on this area of the business, mm -hmm. right, or cut costs here, we want to be that advisor to you. Yeah. That's the, that's the essence of the business right now. Sounds incredible. With your experience, your past experience, are you running this from the ground up differently than the other ones? Yeah. In what ways are you doing that? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I would say a few things. One, knowing where to focus. So again, I have to consume my own medicine, yeah. right? Product, Zone of genius. Yeah. Pro product and distribution. So am I building, this, building something that people want? Getting early customers. You're never going to be fully ready. There's kind of a balance between um, the whole MVP mm -hmm. discussion, right? Mm -hmm. Where that's led to like really bad products that get pre release. Yep. <laughs> I'm running a, right? Like there's a limit, yeah. especially now with the expectations yeah. are higher. So I'm not going to get into all that, but I have a skill set that I can offer to customers that helps yeah. them. So I'm, go I'm getting off the ground early. I'm yeah. finding early customers who need this and who are willing to partner because of also the background I've built and credibility. Yeah. So we do have customers already. So just speed to action, yeah. right? Generating value for them, learning along the way. And then it's hiring. I didn't answer your, uh, one of your questions, hiring slowly, mm. being very, I mean, that's part of the value prop of us too, right? You don't have to hire an internal kind of finance person yeah. for a while because nice. we're that for you. So yeah. we're also saving you money, but just being very thoughtful about kind of who you're getting involved with the business. We do have people involved in the business, but being very methodical about how we're onboarding folks to our team. I think the the hire slow, fire fast makes sense, but the fire fast feels so bad that it's like, man, I'll do, I'll do whatever it takes to hire slower. If this way it means I don't have to rip it, this bandaid off. It sucks. It sucks. Yeah. Reva, you've made it to the end of the podcast. Here. Wow. Yeah. We've we blew through it. Um, I want to acknowledge you for all that you're doing. I love, I love the the root of your mission behind these businesses to to serve and impact people, to get people to do what's in their zone of genius. I think is really important because when people do that, the world benefits. Which we live in a very distracted time in the world right now. Um, and also, you're just very kind. You're a very kind person. So I've enjoyed our time together. Got one more question for you. Yes. The final question of the podcast is. What does it mean to live a fulfilling life? Living a fulfilling life. That definition has changed for me since even a year and a half ago. I truly believe it means being aligned with your true nature and being free to express yourself. 
what you're naturally meant to be. Any self-suppression, doing things out of external expectation causes, you may get external things, you may not. It causes undue, suppressed energy, not fulfilling your potential and just being able to be free because you're just so in tune with who you're meant to be is Mm. a fulfilled life. Whatever that mission is, no judgment on what that is. Yeah, love it. Where can people connect with you? How can they get more of you? Even though you've you've cut ties with I, the world. I, I'm in the process of cutting ties <laughs> a little bit with social media as we talked yeah. about before the podcast. But um, you can email me at Reva, R-E-V-A, at Ver, V-E-R-R, dot co. Nice. And chat over email. Love it. Send them an email. That email address will be in the show notes. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Dick. Bye. That was the episode. You just listened to it. I told you, Rava is legit. Did I not? You guys got to start listening to me. I got some good things to say. Come on now. Don't forget to leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and share this episode with a friend that you think about more often than you should. You know, maybe there's maybe there's something in the back of your mind where you're just like, I can't stop thinking about them. Share this episode with that person. It'll take five seconds and your screen time will thank you. The real reason you're still here is you want to know the answer to the riddle of the week. What do you call a line of men waiting to get haircuts? A barber cue. Let's break this one down. Barber cue. Barber cue. Thank you for tuning in. See you next Friday at 6 a.m. Be kind, be strong, be disciplined, be obsessed. Get gritty. Bye-bye.